The head of the Huayne clan is young and handsome, and he never ages. All Elvadorians must prove their worth to the head of the family. And if you can't do it, you're a loser and become tree fodder. Magnus, head of the Elvador family. Where is his bride? He asked the girl, who was sitting on the floor with her hands tied. Gloriosa, Elvador? Oh yes, back in a time she can't remember very well. Her name was Gloriosa. The Huayne clan are flower people who grow special flowers. An isolated and powerful family with a proud history of thousands of years. Elvador will be destroyed today because of her. After she was sacrificed to the divine tree, she gradually assimilated with it. But at the same time she was using that power, pretending to provide the information her family wanted. But she was actually hiding a secret code inside. A little more, a little more, and she'll bring the man who will overthrow Elvador here. However, this man, her fiancé, Duke Arvid Joltesia. How could such a coincidence happen? The Duke asks him where he hid Gloriosa. If you don't answer this time, he'll cut out his tongue. Through gritted teeth, the man replied that the wench was behind that veil. That's ridiculous, Big Brother Magnus. He only wished he could see his miserable face in person. When he became enslaved to someone he ignored just because he was a child. Because he can't stay here anymore. The girl thought, ah, she can hear footsteps. If she still had her heart, it would surely be beating very hard. The Duke came in and said, Ha! That's why he couldn't find her. It seemed suspicious the whole time. And he wondered why, in terms of Elvador's, he felt like he was somewhere they wanted to bring him, not kill him. But it turns out she was asking him to find the Divine Tree. No, to find her. Well, anyway, thanks to her, he was having a lot of fun. Rivalry with her was the only incentive in his damn life. And so now tell him what she wants him to do. She hopes those people will suffer as much as she did, Gloriosa. The Duke asked, What next? Cut down that tree and burn it so that not a trace of it remains. All right, he'll do it the way she wants it done, the Duke said. What, what is he going to do? Stop, asked a man, disguised as a woman who was kneeling with his hands tied. They will suffer in the hell the Duke created for them forever. Duke approached Gloriosa and asked, What will happen to her if he cuts down this tree? Her soul will be freed, but he will be damned. Duke said getting cursed for his bride is so romantic. Duke said he already has three curses, so he doesn't care if another one is added. He began to snip the roots to free Gloriosa from that tree. The girl screamed in pain, but she doesn't want to be a tree for the rest of her life. She's human. Duke took his cane, pointed it at the tree, and a beam of passion appeared that cut the tree in half. When this happened, he told his bride that she could now rest a little. The girl said, Thank you, Arvid. If she had lived with him, then things would have been different. Maybe they would have been very happy. In some future she didn't have, but which could have been hers. Closing her eyes there and opening her eyes here, the girl heard music. Blinking once more and opening her eyes, she thought it must be a dream, but her hands moved like a human's. When she looked up, she saw Magnus. She thought, isn't he dead? That's the guy who had long hair, red, sitting on the floor with his hands tied. The girl thought, this is a scary dream. A voice said, That's enough. All the children have stopped playing, each playing his own instrument. The voice said, It's all good. They did their best, except for one person. So, what is this feeling of deja vu? wondered the girl. She heard that, except for her gloriosa, as if this were the last spring banquet she'd ever attended as a human being. Magnus, getting angry, said, What, you useless wench? Before she dies, she sees moments from her life. Magnus shouted, Stop playing, he's going to check your fingers. Everybody get up and line up quickly. She has a lot of other memories. But why did this day come up? Magnus began to walk up to each of the children and examine their hands. The first one was a boy. He went over to him and told him he hadn't had enough yet. When he said the next, he rested his eyes on her, Gloriosa. She was standing there and wouldn't give him her hand. He grabbed her hand. The girl screamed painfully. But why does it hurt if it's a dream? She thought. Isn't she dreaming? Gloriosa was afraid. Magnus turned to her and said, Gloriosa. And the girl thought that if this was a real day from the past, then Magnus would now say, She's so ugly that she can't even have one petal bloom. It looks like she's the one who's going to be the fodder for the tree. Exactly, she thought. He wasn't wrong. Not in a single word. When can she contribute to the family already? said Magnus, and walked away. Gloriosa began to stay standing and thinking. She was definitely dead. She distinctly remembers letting out her last breath in Arvid's arms. 
but she did destroy that insufferable family and send Magnus to hell. Will she have to go through all this again? Even in death she can't be free of it. But why why the hell go and resent it? Gloriosa. Gloriosa, as of today you're on probation. Practice that lousy liar in your room, Magnus said. The children who surrounded her also began to avoid her. One boy said, Come on, you don't want to mess with someone who is in the last place. And then Gloriosa laughed her wildest laugh, and laughed because no, it's not the same. All the information she had seen and heard when she was a sacred tree remained in her mind now. All the things the Elvador would be doing in the future, and how their situation would unfold. It's a gift from Arvid, the girl thought. He's the greatest mage in history, so he can probably turn back time. Thanks to him, in a previous life he saved her. But in this life, she's going to save herself. And also, she's going to meet him. Elvador of the Huayn family had a special ability. Namely, flowers bloomed on their little fingers. As the ability developed, a mark appeared on the nail. And each flower had a unique power. And only after the flowers bloomed were they recognized as members of the family. So the children did their best to make them bloom. Usually they bloom by the age of twelve. But hers had barely begun to blossom at the age of fourteen. Even so, she didn't have any special abilities. Of all the thirty-seven children of the previous head of families, she was the most useless. And in the end, she was thrown into the tree fodder, the girl pondered. Looking in the mirror, she thought she really was human again. Examining her index finger, Gloriosa thought that also her ability had also returned to its original state, still only a bud. Turning around, Gloriosa saw a flower erupting from the floor with buds already open. Did she not only have her memories, but also her abilities? However, her flower power is a flower flame that can't burn anything. Gloriosa reflected that it only looked luxurious, but in fact, useless. What should she do with it now? Someone knocked on the door and said, Young Lady Gloriosa. The girl thought that someone was coming and she had to hide the flower quickly so that no one would see it. She grabbed it sharply and blew it up, hiding the bud behind herself. The Young Lady Gloriosa knocked on the door again. The door swung open and a maid came in. She asked what you were doing and why you were not practicing the liar. The girl must hide her abilities for a while. Behind her back she held a tightly clutched flower so that no one would see what she could do. Noma is her nanny and maid, as well as a spy who reports her every move to Magnus. The girl thought it would be a good idea to start with Noma. Hurry up and sit down at the liar. She's only making the maid get more work. I won't, said the girl. Noma cried out. What did you say? You won't practice. Are you crazy? Yeah the girl said. Maybe she could say one more crazy thing. Sitting on the bed, you're fired, Noma. You? You've certainly lost your mind, the nanny said. How are you going to fire her? That sounds unbelievable. A laugh came from the girl. Well, you do steal women's jewelry, don't you? Gloriosa said. What are you talking about? Asked the nanny. The girl said, Don't think about running away. It won't help you. Gloriosa said she knew those jewels were under this bed. Nanny Noma shouted, That's slander! Then the girl said that she thought that when needed, Noma could cover for her. Slander? Do you say Noma, reveal, stole the jewelry? Or do you want to frame the mistress? Asked Gloriosa. Because of her fears, the many children in the house kept their distance from each other. And since she was the most useless of all, she was despised. No one ever came into her room except Nanny Noma. Then after she became a sacred tree, she found out that she had been hiding the stolen jewels in her room. However, even if the truth came out, no one would doubt her now. Vitya, she was forbidden to go near the other mistresses, but with Noma it would be different. Death awaited her. Such a silly mom. What's even more silly is that she has in the past really tried her best to make the house love her. But unfortunately, Norma, she was always indifferent. However, she was the only person who was there for her, so the girl now had a good plan. She would not now do something as stupid as she had done before. So she told Noma that she was going to go to the first mistress. She will tell you that someone is stealing jewelry and that you have four accomplices. Noma was horrified and didn't know what to tell her. All her plans were ruined. I say, from behind she continued, which of the four is recognized first? You were the one in charge of everything, weren't you, Noma? Servants who have been in Elvador for a long time must be savvy. In order to survive, one must distinguish between what can be touched and what must be avoided. Noma stood aghast, wondering what had suddenly happened to Gloriosa. They were no longer dead eyes as they had been a few days ago. They were eyes that radiated bright vitality, 
as if overnight Gloriosa had simply become a different person. Gloriosa asked that you had nothing to say to her. After all, she was smart. Mom, it's time to choose. Are you for her or against her? Enoma asked. Lady, would you like her to do something for you? Gloriosa rejoiced, she thought. Yes, and yet Noma is still as smart as she was before, in past lives. But exhaling, in a stern voice she answered her, Go to the maids and tell them to come to Gloriosa one by one and secretly. To this the girl added that number should beware, the ogre showing his little finger. After all, there's no guarantee that Magnus is the only one who can make it bloom, right? The flower ogre? Three days later, Gloriosa woke up early in the morning. It was a warm, sunny day. The girl lay on her bed and thought that her mother must have been scared. In all these three days, no one had come. Since Gloriosa is Magnus's only sibling, she must be, she thought. She too could raise an ogre. After all, the girl had hinted to her by showing her little finger, and the pinky toenail showed the unopened bud of a future flower. Gloriosa suspected Norma would want to run away with all the jewelry. She was capable of such a thing. Well, it all worked out all right in the end, because now there were fewer eyes watching Gloriosa. She managed to attract a few more maids thanks to the information she had gotten when she was a sacred tree. Well, the real problem is this. Gloriosa looked at her hand, which was all red from the flower she'd plucked to hide it from Nanny's eyes. A useless flower without the heat of fire, her flowers are incapable of burning anything, only leaving soot. This was the main reason why it was chosen as food for the sacred tree. Had her abilities changed since her return, she thought? She doesn't know the details, but it is obvious that the regression has affected her body. The high fever has made her body ache all over. Good thing she's on probation. The heat made her very sick. She cried out to Arvid, who had found her and who had saved her. But pulling herself together, Gloriosa thought that now was not the time for her to lie in bed. I should eat something to cheer myself up. I looked at my plate on the nightstand beside the bed, but there were crumbs, and there was a note under the plate. Gloriosa took the paper in her hands and began to read. It said that a guest from the Duchy of Yoltesia was coming. Not bad for maids, the girl thought. Crumpling up the letter, the girl thought, Well, let's get started. Today is the only day of the year that Elvador opens its doors and welcomes guests. The spring banquet begins, the day Arvid arrives. This is the only day when Elvador opens its doors, and also on this day, all four duchies of the Empire are invited. The family of the North and the connections of Gaios, Salvador, the Flower family of the East, Anasa, the family of Chronicles in the West, and the Star family of the South of Yultesia. The first emperor gifted each state, and only the heads of the families and their successors knew what these divine objects were and where they were hidden. The wisdom tree of the Elvadors was one of these objects. Arvid destroyed all divine gifts in the future, including this tree. Arvid was going to do it when he was young. Then she might be of use to him. The girl followed through on this appointment, and very lucky, because of the fact that she remembers everything. She knows the essence and location of all divine objects. She would have to make a little hustle to talk to Arvid. The girl stood before the tall doors that led to the ceremonial hall where the whole event was taking place. This would be her first time playing an instrument. She's had enough of being a sacred tree. The only remaining question was whether her half-brothers were still as dumb as they had been in their previous lives. Walking into the hall, she thought. And so, who to start with? But the children seated at the reception were, as usual, chattering away at whatever they wanted. She was too late. How nice it had been until she showed up. As soon as Gloriosa came in, one of her brothers cried out. The probationary period was over. He took the bone, which he had already stripped of its meat, in his hands. And he threw this bone at Gloriosa's head. The bone flew and hit the girl right on the back of the head. The bone fell beside her. The same brother shouted to her, Eat the leftovers! Get out of here! Her brother continued to mock her further and asked, Why doesn't she say anything back to him? She ought to say thank you, Bert, and get out of here quick! shouted the boy. All the other boys who were in the room also picked up with laughter, whistling and so on. One of the guys yelled out that she was so touched she couldn't even utter anything. But our heroine was not upset at all. On the contrary, she thought she had gotten Bert. Bert, the only son of the first wife, gets the best grades. However, after Magnus took the place of the head, he became a nobody. Sooner or later Bert will die at Magnus's hands. So she, knowing the future, sees how worthless he is in this situation. She thought every word carefully and said thank you, 
It must be delicious. Her brother Bert thought she must realize that she had been insulted. She was so pathetic. But only Gloriosa sympathized with all these onlookers. She answered again that thanks to Brother Bert she would be well fed, and the girl smiled. Bert hesitated due to nervousness. He noticed that her expression had changed. He thought she was going to grovel as usual. But for some reason Gloriosa smiles like that, and the girl retorts, Shouldn't she? Shouldn't she give something in return to her beloved brother Bert? Since Gloriosa had managed to coax a few maids in her time, at that very moment, those maids turned a pot of food on Bert's head. There was absolute silence in the hall. The maids stood at the back. All the children sat silent and looked at Bert. He, frankly speaking, was also silent and did not know what to say. He was not prepared for this situation. One of the girls present asked what had just happened, why the maids had turned a pot of food on Bert's head. And then Bert came to his senses and shouted, Gloriosa, she's crazy. Do you think you can get away with this? He shouted at the maids. He will personally punish each and every one of you. But the maid said he couldn't. Bert cried out, What? She dared to say? But the maid replied that in order to punish them, one must first get permission from the head of the family. The maids continued, Your words, Bert, could be seen as a challenge to the authority of the head of the family. Gloriosa joined the conversation and said that if her brother continued to behave like this, she would have no choice but to report everything to the head of the family. But Bert doesn't give up. He yells at his stepsister again. Just dare to do that. You want to be flogged. But Gloriosa is perfectly calm. She replies to him, Bert, whatever you do, it will be useless. You don't even have to try. From that day on, all the maids became Gloriosa's maids. She knows everything about everyone who eats and sleeps in Elvador because of the tree she had to be with in her past life. She knows their families, their desires. So making them her puppets wasn't that hard. You just have to use the right carrot and stick. Gloriosa laughed a little and asked Bert, So why is he so angry? I mean he got first place, undeserved. But Bert shouted, How is it undeserved? Gloriosa replied, Bert, you knew the answers beforehand. That's why you got first place. And then one of the girls said upon hearing this, Is that why Isla was only second in the rankings all along? The girl began to scream, Is it true? Also yelling at her was Bert. Gloriosa, how could she be such a... Like her, you rascal! Gloriosa pouted for an answer. You ask how she knew and you don't deny it. Then a girl named Isla cried out, Bert, you're not a good person because you've been lying to everyone all the time. Bert shouted that it wasn't just that he thought she was really strange. But Gloriosa only thought, It's exactly as I expected. Now what needs to happen is about to happen. The girl proceeded to the side of the window and said, So, game two. Swinging open the window, she turned to the children and announced to all of them loud and clear, You're going to have to be stuck here for a while. Don't even think about running. It's impossible. All the doors leading outside were locked by the maids, and the windows, too, had better be abandoned. Literally in an instant, a flower began to sprout in this room where everyone was sitting. Her flower, which she knew how to grow with her powers. Lastly, she said that if they didn't want to be burned alive, they should sit still around them. The girl opened all the buds, and they turned fiery yellow. Gloriosa at that moment jumped out of the window into the street, but no such luck. No, no one's chasing her, it's just that her body hasn't fully recovered yet. It's very hard on her. She was using far too much of her powers. The girl thought that she had been locked up for a while, and she didn't have much time, so she should move. If she doesn't show up, someone will be here soon. We have to hurry. Gloriosa sneaked into the garden where the ladies and gentlemen were strolling. Gloriosa thought that from here, hidden in the bushes and already seeing people, she would have to crawl. The girl really hoped it wasn't too late and no one would notice her. As she crawled, she saw drops of blood on the grass. It was her nosebleed. She thought she was too overworked. She needed to rest, but she also needed to meet. This is the first time Anash has used her ability, so it made sense that it would be a blow to her body, especially with so many buttons open to such power. For a moment, Gloriosa remembered, because of her weak state, how she had once been a little girl and was sitting on the grass by herself like that. Her mother came up to her and asked, Daughter? Did she hurt herself somewhere? When she saw her daughter, she thought she had fallen because the girl was sitting on the grass crying. Her mother took her in her arms and carried her, saying to her, Gloriosa, remember those born to Elvador. The more they hurt, the stronger they become. But if something were to happen to her, 
What would be hard for her to bear? Then you need to find your fiancé. Her fiancé is the son of her mom's most precious and special friend. Together with him, they would surely be able to overcome everything. Soon after her mother told her that, she suddenly left the world as if she had foreseen her own death. Don't worry, mother. Just like her mother said, she has become as strong as her past life was torturous, and she will surely meet her fiancé. Countess Juris, you're all right, aren't you? As Gloriosa crawled as close to the bushes as she could, she heard them talking. What do you mean, young master? They say your son has distinguished himself in this hunting competition. Gloriosa saw several people standing around talking. Among these people, of course, she notices the shiny silver hair. She can only see his back. But even from his voice, she can tell who it is. Arvid! She's so glad she found him faster than she could have imagined. But how Gloriosa should approach him, she didn't know. The girl continued the conversation by saying that her son had distinguished himself in the hunt. Arvid replied that he had heard. Your son amused the audience several times by firing arrows in the wrong place. The girl went on to say of her son that he had a mild temperament, so he was in no condition to shoot the unfortunate animal. You don't know much about her son, she said. Arvid said he asked you to forgive him if he had offended. He thought you might like the story of her son, too, since you were so animated in telling the story of the young lady, whom you had not even seen. Gloriosa, lurking in the bushes, thought about the young lady he was talking about. The girl continued to reply to Arvid. She doesn't know why she has to listen to your insults. She has never met her, but the information about her is true. Besides, this incapable younger sister of the head of the family was nowhere to be seen even at the banquet. And that's when I realized what it is, not what it's about. It's true that she can't do anything after rebirth. But if Arvid stood up for her, that means he knows she's his fiancée too. Arvid bowed to the young lady and said he hoped your son's hopes of becoming a royal knight were not realized. Goodbye. Arvid turned around and walked away. The woman who was standing there talking about her son became very indignant. Her husband came up to her and asked her what was wrong, dear, why she was so nervous. The woman now proceeded to complain to her husband, saying, Darling, you just listen to the young master and you'll tease ya. Gloriosa saw that Arvid had gone into the woods. Gloriosa needs to go after him before she misses him. As suddenly this man shouted that cheeky puppy, How dare he! He will go and teach him good manners right now. Young master, stay there, shouted the man, the husband of the girl who was talking to Arvid. Gloriosa thought that if he interfered, it would only complicate things. The man kept running after him, shouting, Young master, you'll tease ya! So then Gloriosa came up with the idea of using her powers and her flower. Where the gentleman had run by, she was able to sprout a flower at the table leg. The flower sprouted very quickly, opened its buds, and everything started to catch fire. The women started screaming. Their dresses caught fire. The tablecloth that was covering the tables. The fire. Everybody started screaming, and Gloriosa sped up to run into the woods and intercept Arvid. She ran into the woods and thought he shouldn't have gotten this far. The girl asked, Where is he? After all, it's because the head of the family is also quite vulnerable. Just then a voice came from behind the bushes. Who the hell would come to a place like this? Gloriosa lurked behind a tree, literally. She didn't even breathe, just so she wouldn't be noticed. It's annoying, but let's take a quick look around here, said the guy's voice. Gloriosa, of course, recognized them. They were Magnus's escorts. If they go this way toward the woods, it's all gone. She can't get in that way herself. What is to be done? thought the girl. Gloriosa inadvertently stepped on a branch lying next to her. Sure enough, the branch snapped and made a sound. The guards began to whisper among themselves. They didn't hear any sound now. Over there, what sound exactly? One of the convoyers asked. Gloriosa had already covered her mouth with both hands just to keep from breathing. The convoy said, There, there, it's like something's moving. But the girl stood silent and thought that no, if they caught her here now, all plans were over and the chance at this life would fail again. But she didn't even have anywhere to run. She just stood there nervously, huddled against a tree. Suddenly one of the convoy looked out from behind a tree and said, There was definitely something here. A second escort came over and looked in too, saying there was no one here. Convoy said, But he definitely heard that someone was here. The second convoyman replied, It sounds like a squirrel just ran through here. At this point, Gloriosa was sitting in a tall tree up in the branches. 
and these guys didn't notice her. Let's move faster, the convoyman said, and Gloriosa continued to stay in the tree. Gone, thank God, thought the girl. Thanks to that tree she survived by looking up at it, and as it happened, at that moment she had no idea that she had been lifted by a tree at the most crucial moment. Gloriosa turned to the tree and asked it, Were you the one who helped me hide? And the tree began to whisper, We'll help, we'll help, Gloriosa, we'll help. It's the voice of the trees, the girl thought in surprise. They are helping me. The divine tree is the being that controls all the plants in the world. She still has the power of the divine tree. The flower's abilities are minor, but with these trees they would be useful. Then Gloriosa thought she could ask the tree for help, and asked if it could help her with anything. The girl asked to move to another tree, where the one she must surely meet. And then the tree picked up the girl, wrapping its branch around her waist, and it began to be passed from one branch to another from another tree. Gloriosa was overjoyed. What luck that she had no fear of heights, because it was all high. The tree kept going on and on, passing her from branch to branch. Gloriosa thought she had completely missed Arvid while she was hiding from the convoy. It would be hard for her to find him alone in this vast forest. Then Gloriosa would have to use her power again. She took out her little finger and waved it. In an instant, her flower, which she was able to curb, began to spread through all the trees. It began to stretch out on all the branches and unfold. From afar it was a very beautiful sight. The whole forest was covered with yellow and yellow-red flowers, but they didn't make fire. They were just shining brightly, like the sun. Because the girl was using her power again, blood started dripping from her nose again. Ugh! Gloriosa said and staggered back. The power had weakened a bit, but the tree was worried about her too. It reached out its twig to her, and Gloriosa reassured the tree. Don't worry, it's fine. It's because I used most of my power abruptly. If you look at the course of a past life, Arvid probably went into the forest to find a divine tree, the girl thought. If he sees this bright light she was able to create, he will definitely come here to see her. As Gloriosa stood looking out at Arvid, a wind blew in from somewhere, and sure enough the girl staggered, her feet slipping off the branch and she couldn't hold on. All she had time to say was that she was falling, and flew down screaming, Ah! At one point, the girl just froze in midair. She herself couldn't understand everything that was wrong. She should have fallen and hit herself painfully by now. But no. A voice rang out. What are you doing there? Gloriosa turned to the side and saw him. He thought it was just a small squirrel. Standing there was a guy with blonde hair. It was him, Arvid. Toward the girl he took her in his arms. Arvid had powers and abilities too. He asked, Why did you climb the tree? A little more and he might have mistaken you for a hired assassin. The guy said she could have died by his hand. He looked at her, but his eyes were in a blindfold. The guy asked to be more careful next time. The girl continued to remain silent. Then Arvid asked, Aren't you going to climb down? Gloriosa was so happy that it was Arvid. She thought it was him, hugging her. She didn't want to climb down. She said, No, but then thought it wasn't nice, so she said, Bring me down to earth. The guy asked, These flowers, did you bloom them? and poked his finger at the flower. Gloriosa thought he couldn't see anything because of the bandage, and answered, This flower is called Gloriosa. Arvid interjected, Gloriosa? And the girl answered that her name was also Gloriosa. But she thought she wished so much that he knew her or recognized her and said that he knew her. A silence formed, and only Gloriosa's thoughts were that, Please tell me you know her. And finally Arvid said, Well, that's right, it's you, his fiancée. Gloriosa smiled very much and was pleased. She realized that he knew her. That was all she wanted at that moment. As they stood there was a voice. The young master must be around here somewhere. It was Magnus's soldiers. Gloriosa met these soldiers sooner than she expected. But she hurriedly told Arvid that it was the first time he was seeing her, so her words might seem absurd to him. However, she has something to say, or rather, to suggest to him. She, uh... She hesitated to say, but finally spoke very quickly, that she wanted to offer him an arranged marriage. Arvid said he knew what she wanted. She grabs his hand and says he wants to destroy the divine gifts, right? She can't explain everything, but she'll definitely be useful to him. She can also tell him where the sacred tree is located. Just one year into their marriage, she will share all the information she knows. She asked Arvid to take her away from her family. Please. Arvid asked her permission to look closer at her flowers. From afar came the voices of soldiers. Hurry! I'm faster! He's here somewhere! 
Then Gloriosa thought she should show him her flowers as soon as possible. As usual, taking out her little finger, she used her powers, and her flower began to sprout on her. She thought that she should show it as soon as possible, to have time to make sure that nothing happened to it. Gloriosa, when she was covered with her own flowers, said, That's it, look. Arvid took Gloriosa's hand and put her hand to his heart. The girl was surprised by his action. The guy's words were that he could see her even through his blindfolded eyes. Gloriosa saw that Arvid was crying, his tears flowing. She was shocked. What happened? The guards rushed in shouting that the young master was here. They surrounded them. Gloriosa saw that her flowers, if they were spotted, should take care not to see them. Well, what about Arvida? Gloriosa asked. Arvid said he would call her that affectionately now. Riosi? Gloriosa interjected. Arvid said he would call her that affectionately now. Gloriosa didn't like what Arvid would call her at first, but then she stood up and thought that no one had ever addressed her that way. Somehow her useless name seemed so cute now. Gloriosa wondered if she deserved to be treated so well. As she pondered, Magnus's guards surrounded them on all sides. Eventually they were caught. Gloriosa sat next to Arvid and wondered if he would be all right. Magnus turned to Arvid, who said that young Master Yultisha was being disrespectful in someone else's home, shouted Magnus. The road was purposely made with flower beds. How could you get lost in Elvador's garden? Magnus began to doubt the young master. Of course he realizes that the young master is still at the age where one likes to play hide and seek. However, Gloriosa thought of the atmosphere of fear that prevailed despite his strength. Arvid was still a child. Gloriosa wondered if she should do something. Arvid asked if there was anyone who responded to a fox barking. Arvid continued to speak about the foxes losing their wild nature and hiding in front of him. Gloriosa was astonished at this. How could he say such a thing? Magnus, annoyed, shouted at the young lord. What nonsense are you talking? The reason Arvid came to Elvador today is to find his bride. Arvid, taking the Gladiosa by the hand, raised their hands and said, Here is his bride, this child. Then Arvid added, So from now on she should be treated as a member of the family, Yultesia. He was terrified. All he could do was shout, What? He's taking the Gloriosa even though she was the one who asked him to take her. The girl thought, Why did he change his mind so suddenly? Weren't they just supposed to run away together? Magnus said, What bride? He hadn't heard anything about it. Arvid said, That's right. After all, the head of Elvador, a young chicken just taking the position. There are probably many more things we don't know. Magnus had said that in any case, the blood of the Elvador family flowed in Gloriosa. The girl wondered what he was implying. Is he really going to create an ogre? Because some kind of flower was spreading out from Magnus. Magnus said he had to think it over first. Only then would he make a decision. Even the knights in the corridor became nervous. Gloriosa noticed that, as expected, the situation was getting worse. The girl began to whisper to Arvid that as far as the engagement was concerned, the proof had to be found first. Arvid asked Magnus to treat Riosi the same way he treated him. Magnus became furious again and shouted, what? Arvid decided to piss Magnus off for good and said, It seems that the head of the Elvador is having trouble understanding. Then he'll say it again. Gloriosa, his fiance, the head of the family, has no right to decide where she should be. Is there something he still didn't understand? Magnus lost his temper completely after all those words from Arvid. Some kind of magic, or rather someone's magic, began to spread throughout the room. Gloriosa thought she had seen such magic before like the very day Elvador had died. She knew Arvid had that ability. Magnus began to shout what was going on, what he was doing in his palace, and it must be stopped immediately. But Arvid drank his tea calmly, as if nothing had happened. Suddenly, one moment a man's leg appeared from that force, and the next second the whole man appeared. With the words, Ugh, he's apologizing. No way to get used to this. The man who appeared greeted everyone, bowed, and introduced himself. His name was Helbert, and he was Duke Yultesius's chief butler. He had come to Elvador at his master's call. All the guards who were in the room couldn't believe it and thought, What nonsense! How did he end up here? The journey from Yultesia to Elvador takes two months. Gloriosa thought that the ancestral magic secretly passed down in Yultesa was an incredible ability. What's the matter? asked Magnus. What should be worth all this fuss? The butler said first. Check this, please and held out a piece of paper on which something was written. Arvid said it was a testament to their mother's friendship. If you look closely, 
you will see that the words of the representative of the chapter are true, their gate, said the butler. The girl looked at Arvid and marveled, the representative of the head of the family, right now in the hands of the Orbid. All the power of the Yoltesia family. That's why he's acting like this with Magnus. Then that changes everything, Gloriosa thought. Because her mother had seen this coming and left the papers in plain sight. Because otherwise Magnus would have stolen them by now. Magnus studied the entire sheet and said, However, while you are still too young, it would be nice if you just saw each other once a year. Arvid asked. Says who? Magnus asked. So what is the young master going to do? Arvid replied that he was getting married today, so get the paperwork ready. Magnus shouted. What nonsense is this? There is a limit to his patience, young master. Magnus continued to resent the young lord for allowing himself too much. And then the gentleman couldn't take it anymore. He used all the strength he had. Well, maybe not all of them. Arvid said, You say interesting things. Did he ask your permission? Do not test him, Mr. Elvador, because there is a limit to what you can endure. Arvid's strength too huge blue paws grabbed Magnus by his pelt and pinned him to the table. Riosi will be with him while the marriage papers are prepared. The butler held out his hand to the girl and said, Come along. Magnus had lost, finally. She'll be able to say goodbye to that damned Elvador, the girl thought with one last look at him. How long has she waited for this moment? Now her life would change. Arvid asked the girl if she was afraid, but his confidence was slowly spreading to Gloriosa. Said it was about going someplace she'd never been before, but the girl replied that she wasn't scared at all, and then Arvid said she was brave. Arvid held out his hand to her, and Gloriosa thought that now she could live a new life, the life of a human being, not a tree. Let's go to Yultisha, the boy said. While they were waiting for the documents for the wedding, it was already evening, and a table was set for them on the terrace. Arvid and Gloriosa are sitting at the table. The girl wondered if she still had powers from the time when she was a sacred tree. She speaks all seven languages fluently, and remembers well how each country was born, and how its history was erased. Ideas that future the entire empire and the promising talents of each family. And she even knows ways to put it all to good use. But most importantly, but Arvid, what he's offering her now just doesn't make sense. What's the matter? The guy asked the girl. Did she have any questions? Yes, Gloriosa said. She had no idea how it should be eaten. On the table, on a plate in front of Gladiosa, was the most beautiful cake with whipped cream and strawberries. It was very nicely decorated and very appetizing. If she did something wrong, she would ruin all that beautiful mold. After all, even by rebirth, she had never eaten such beautiful food. She still didn't know how to handle that fork so she could carefully break off a piece and taste that wonderful brownie. Gloriosa sighed and thought it couldn't be helped. She said she couldn't eat it. Arvid asked why. He thought she was hungry. It's not that she doesn't want to. It's that she doesn't know how to eat such sumptuous food. And this brownie isn't even hard, and she doesn't know how to eat it. She feels like she could even break it with a knife. So it's okay, the girl said. But she thought to herself. How could it be that she really had become human after all? Because she was starting to feel a sense of hunger. She hadn't had that before. When she was a tree, she didn't even know what the feeling of hunger was. Arvid motioned for her to sit closer to him. He would feed her and show her how to cut such food. In return, could she bloom the flower one more time? The girl agreed to conjure up a flower. The flower sprouted all the way to the table and opened its beautiful bud near the plate with the cake. The guy said, Okay, thank you. Thanks to her, he'll be able to see well. Then Gloriosa asked that her flower was lighting up the space in front of him, and the lad replied that he supposed it was. Gloriosa thought her flowers could hurt, but it turns out they can only hurt her. After all, there's not much use for them. But in this situation, she is very glad that she can be useful to him. Arvid questioned helpfully. Everything, everything that has no value is thrown away, said the girl, and she doesn't want him to leave her. Arvid looked at her at that moment. Then he took a fork and knife and carefully cut off a piece of cake and handed it to Gloriosa and said, Um. The girl shrieked no. If you tell her how to do it, she can do it herself. But Arvid said, Come on, his hand is tired from holding the fork. Then Gloriosa finally opened her mouth and ate that piece. It was so delicious, it felt like it was made of angel wings and clouds. Arvid loved the way his fiancée expressed herself about this delicious brownie. She was so expressive, he smiled. I thought they were still in Elvador's castle. 
but just being around him makes her feel so safe. Their pleasant conversation was interrupted by the butler coughing on the sidelines. Mr. Arvid, he brought the marriage documents prepared by Elvador. Ah, yes, Arvid replied. Butler brought a tray on which lay the letter itself, two quills and ink. In these documents it was written that a wedding of the appropriate level between the two families would take place after reaching the age of majority. But after reaching the age of majority, if Gloriosa Elvador wishes to divorce, then so be it. Also, if Gloriosa Elvador did not become the legal mistress of Yulteshi, then the marriage would become null and void. Gloriosa was surprised that he had laid out such terms anyway, not knowing that this arranged marriage was for a year. But she didn't think Magnus would let her go so easily. At that moment it seemed that Arvid whispered something else to him. Did that mean there was a secret that could deal Magnus a fatal blow? She was a sacred tree. But even she didn't know about this information. She was curious. But right now, anyway, it was fine. Arvid said. And so, signing off. And they signed the document. Arvid asked, Is that enough, Gloriosa? Girls and so on for now. It is enough that she and Arvid will soon be able to leave Elvador together. Gloriosa replied that yes, she was very happy about that. Took the document and hugged for joy. She would indeed now go to Jolitesia, the Duchy of Joltesia. Late afternoon near the signing of the documents, they traveled there by Pomogic Conduit. After all these events, Gloriosa was very tired and fell asleep on the couch in the lobby. The butler said he didn't know you'd bring the girl here right away. Contact Arvid. Even if she is your fiancé, isn't it customary to meet her once a year? Besides, you know very well how treacherous the head of the Elvador family is. He is a shameless man who has his sights set on imperial power. He is especially favored by the regent for his handsome appearance. Also, his abilities. Because of their disgusting custom of using humans as fodder, they have a bad reputation in the imperial castle. The next head of the Iltesia family is coming soon. But who would have thought that at such an important time, you would bring this man's younger sister into the house? Does he dare ask you why you made such a hasty decision? said the butler. Arvid replied, This flower, hold it up to your face, Helbert. The butler asked, Did you say bring it up to his face? Yes, Arvid replied. The butler took the flower and asked, Did he do the right thing, master? When the flower was in front of Arvid's eyes, the boy was able to see again. Arvid replied that he could see. The butler interjected, Did you say you can see? Yes, he can see you, Kelbert. Turns out you've been growing a mustache. The butler was very happy. Mr. Master really can see. He really can see. He didn't know what to say out of excitement. Despite the curse of Iltesia, cursed be the entire Iltesian race, a will left by the first emperor before his death. Because of it, all children born in Iltesia are cursed. And among them, Arvid Iltesia has suffered particularly badly. He is currently under four curses. Since then, he has lost his sight. His damaged body makes him vomit blood, and all living creatures fear him, and the last one from birth. He is deprived of a certain amount of emotion. Of course, even though he can't see anything in front of him, he is able to see the truth in the stars and the cosmos. And thanks to his developed senses, he can live an ordinary life with only one cane. But there are things in the world that are much more beautiful when he sees them with his own eyes. The butler could not restrain his emotion. Has this really become possible for the master? He kept saying. The butler asked what kind of flower it was. Arvid replied that a miracle had happened to him. Looking at the girl, he said that if it were not for this miracle, he would have suspected that bringing this child close to him was an afterthought. But for some reason, Riosi's flowers give him sight, and miracles can't be controlled. So he had no choice but to believe. Well, what he sees now is what is next to the flower. Still, at least he can see something. The butler says you're quite right, master. The butler wiped away a tear and said that it was indeed a true miracle. Arvid asked that all the conditions necessary for his young wife to live comfortably be taken care of. Power always has a price, and for this flower he should pay the appropriate price, Arvid said. He would be careful to make sure that no one addressed Riosi as a spy. Taking one of the flowers in his hands, he held it up to smell it and said that if they didn't want to defy him, they would have to believe her too. Arvid asked if the butler understood everything. But the man bowed and said he swore and would remember all his words. 
Butler thought that perhaps the previous head of the family knew it would happen like this, pondered Arvid on the contrary, perhaps the fact that Riosa's mother had suggested it to his mother. On the other hand, it was questionable why she would choose to marry her off to a man with so many curses. Whatever the reason, he's not going to let this kid go. You know, Helbert, she's not even afraid of him. She's special, incredibly special. Helbert noticed that it had been so long since he had last seen a smile on the young lord's face. Besides, its rare ability to blossom could bring change to Yoltesia. When the butler had prepared the room, he came to the gentleman and said, do you really don't mind him taking her to the bedroom? But the lad said, She'll wake up soon, so he'll wait. Although it would probably be better to do as Helbert said. Amazingly, he brought his bride to him from where he was going to break off the engagement, Arvid pondered. He looked at her and couldn't take his eyes off her. When she's asleep, she's completely different than she used to be. The girl in the forest, she was trembling with fear, but there was determination in her voice and golden light was pouring in from all sides. Her eyes are like Venus, and her eyelashes are like the Milky Way. Her face was the first he had seen since he was born. Arvid stroked her face. He wished she would wake up soon and show him her eyes once more. Sometimes she looks so happy. Those are special moments for him. Another young man entered the room saying, When you look happy, those are special moments. Isn't it your role to make always many a distressed look? Said the guy, addressing Arvid. That guy was Lem Iltesia. Why doesn't he make his facial expression softer? If anyone sees him, they'll think he's sick with the plague, Lem told Arvid. But Arvid replied that it didn't matter. Lem stood up and thought about it and said, Apropos of nothing, if there was a reception bedroom here. As far as he was concerned, that wasn't the case a while ago. Arvid replied, As long as he let her stay in his room, so stay out of it. Arvid said that this child was his man. Lem noticed that Arvid growled at once. But he shouldn't act like that with Lem. A look at the child who could be the next head of the family. Lem asked that so, is there a good chance that she will be the next head of the Yultesia family? Arvid replied that he didn't know yet. Well, given her frail constitution, she should be treated with care, Lem remarked. Arvid didn't like that, and made the remark again, saying, stay out of Riosi's way. Lem asked, she seemed to have a crush on his heart, then he'll treat her like a daughter-in-law. It may be temporary, but he cannot tell him what to do. Though he and his father, Gloriosa Elvador, showed her hidden claws to follow the news to each family. He directed his subordinates. He never thought he would hear such an interesting story. One day she suddenly recruited all the maids and forced them to pour soup on the first mistress's son, and she also revealed this child's secret. She might be just the right fit for this snake pit, the father pondered. The case is taking an interesting turn, he thought, Lem thought. Since she's his daughter-in-law, he should treat her well. He should take care of her. So he took off his clothes, stood before the sea, and thought, Then how about the sea queen's eggs? That must be some kind of delicacy. The next day morning came. How could it be? thought the girl. She can't open her eyes because she fears her departure from Elvador might be a dream. But then came Arvid's voice, saying, How long is she going to pretend to be asleep? The girl opened her eyes and saw him. Arvid! she exclaimed. Wake up, Sonia, he replied with a smile. She needs to get up and have breakfast. He asked her if she would like to eat together. It was very surprising for a girl to eat together, too. With joy, she sat up on the bed and flopped onto her back. Arvid asked if she could walk to the dining room. Arvid said that if she got tired, he would ask her to bring food to the room. Gloriosa replied, No, she can walk to the dining room and she wants to go there. All right, replied the boy. Then we'll call the doctor after she's eaten. The girl said, thank you, for his taking care of her. But Arvid replied that it was a matter of course. Now that she was awake, he would introduce her to the maids who would serve her. The guy twiddled his fingers, and in an instant the door opened and four maids came in. He said they would make sure she didn't feel uncomfortable. Then he would go. Take your time while you get ready, I replied. Yes, thank you. As soon as Arvid came out, the maids went straight to work, opening the screen, making the bed, tidying the room. All the girls were friendly, and immediately said hello to the little lady. They were honored to meet her. One of the maids was named Annie, and the other Linda. There were two other maids. The third was named Brill, and the fourth was Phoebe. The girls greeted her and told her that they would serve her today. They said all as one, please trust us. Gloriosa hesitated. Of course I am grateful, 
But do I really need so many people? It is a peculiarity of the Huanes that a member of the race is clean and fragrant even without a bath. The maids began to brush the little miss, and one after another only boasted, Oh, how can you be so beautiful? Your hair is like a sunset. Another said, Oh, that dress will suit the little lady very well, bringing a blue dress to show Gloriosa. It was unfamiliar to the girl. Why do they act like that? She did not understand. It's nice for her to meet you too. Please take good care of her. But she's not little, the girl replied. You don't have to take care of her that much. She is already thirteen years old, soon to be fourteen, and the maids were very surprised. One of the maids said, Gosh, she thought you were nine years old. And another maid added, You have such a small body. And then Gloriosa wondered, Why did they get her age so wrong, even though she was raised in a family where she couldn't eat properly, so her growth was very slow? When the maids were done with putting beauty on Gloriosa, they said they were ready, and she could look at herself. Gloriosa looked great in the blue dress, and she was very pretty in it. They told her that if anything was uncomfortable, they could change it. But Gloriosa liked it very much. She was very much in front of the mirror and could not look at herself. The whole room suddenly seemed new and specially prepared for her. One of the maids pointed toward the door and said she would lead the girl to the dining room. Gloriosa felt like a little girl in this huge palace, and reflected that today was the first day in a new place the first day of the new life she had dreamed of. It was an opportunity she had caught with her own hands and would never let go. She had found it and really thought she would never suffer again. That's what she was thinking as she walked. When she got to the dining room, the door was opened for her, and she saw that everyone said, Welcome, Gloriosa. But the girl was very surprised. And I was surprised that the dining room had such an atmosphere that it was just dark. There was no candle or light, and all the windows were shuttered. A few hours ago, in the kitchen where the maids were discussing the news of the day, one of them says, You heard? Mr. Arvid's fiancée has arrived. What? asked another maid. Why so suddenly? one of the maids said, for there were a great many of them there. What must she be like for that awful man to marry her in one day? Next, the girls discussed that they were the temporary heads of the family, and it was Mr. Arvid's behavior that was suspicious. They thought he had kidnapped this girl. Or no, an even better idea, she's as ugly as Mr. Arvid, said the third maid, just as evil and horrible. Someone said she's from the East, and does anyone know any Eastern food? In case she doesn't like Southern food. So, back to the present. These same maids are present in the room when Miss entered. She asked for all the windows to be opened, so that the room would be light and bright. The girl sat down at the table, and the maid came over with a table on wheels that already had food on it. The girl said she would tell you now, and she started listing. Soup with braised scallops and parsley, marinated tomatoes with cheese, and lamb steak with potatoes. All the dishes looked very tasty and appetizing. After all the dishes were placed on the table, all the maids lined up and lowered their heads, and then Arvid and Gloriosa began their meal. All the maids were shaking as one and praying hard for the girl to like everything. Gloriosa scooped up the soup and brought it to her mouth. Of course Gloriosa liked it all, for she had never eaten such delicious food. She smiled and ate the whole plate with great pleasure. Then the maids who were lined up all exhaled with great mortification that the girl liked everything. Maybe she wasn't as scary as they thought. One of the maids became softer and offered the girl a piece from his plate to try, and held out a fork to her. Gloriosa noticed that all the maids were lined up and looking at them, waiting for some sort of reaction. All the girls began to give their opinions one by one. One said her name was Gloriosa, and another said, I wish she would stay here forever and be their mistress. They had already imagined how she would re-educate Arvid. When Gloriosa ate it all, she said she really enjoyed it, even though she was drawn to all the stairs. Arvid asked, Did you like it, Riosi? Yes, I really did. It was absolutely marvelous, the girl said. A heavenly banquet, Arvid said as she was generous with compliments. And then the girl stopped talking. She thought she must not overdo it. She ate fatty foods after starving herself for a long time, and that's how you can get sick. But she must be all right, because she has worked very hard to get here. For such a delicious meal, she would ask Arvid what she could do for him now. But the boy asked what she would like to do for him. The girl thought for a moment and said she could help Yoltesia. Arvid answered her that okay, that would come later. She had to regain her health now. Gloriosa, of course, tried to object, saying that it wasn't that. 
but Arvid clearly hinted to her that she should take care of her health. Then she asked what he would do. The guy replied that he should get to work. It was time to go through the documents. Gloriosa also asked if she could watch, but Arvid replied that she would probably be bored. But if she wanted to, she could. Arvid turned to his butler, Helbert. Make room for Riosi in the study. The butler replied that yes, it would be done. When Arvid stood up, he said to Gloriosa, Let's go. But the girl held out her hand to him and said, Let's hold hands. She was worried that he would be uncomfortable walking, but she really wanted to do something for him. And then she thought, God, what did she say? This is Arvid's house here, isn't it? What could be the inconvenience? Moreover, how could she help when she herself did not know the internal layout of this house? But Arvid didn't hesitate to take her hand. He told her thanks for her help. He appreciated it all and said, Come on. And they walked together. Arvid offered to walk around the garden while Helbert prepared her seat. Arvid, even though he could have laughed at her in this situation, took her hand. He's also very kind. Pointing with his cane in the other direction, he told them to go that way. Arvid pointed out that his garden didn't compare to the garden to the east, but he hoped she would like it. Gloriosa, of course, replied that she was sure his garden was just as beautiful. The maid opened the door and they went into the garden. At first Gloriosa shouted, Hurrah! because she thought she was going into a beautiful garden. Arvid asked if she liked it, but when the maid opened the door, it was completely ruined. All the trees stood withered. Why is it so neglected here, and no one watches over this garden? said the girl. Arvid replied that they said it was better here at night, though he had never been at such a time. Yes, here it is, said Gloriosa. Gloriosa couldn't tell him the truth. She thought that his garden was nothing like what he imagined, and that everyone was lying to him. He certainly doesn't know anything about the garden. There's no way you can plant flowers here. It will cause a shock. Gloriosa walked around the garden wondering why things had gotten to this point. What was the problem here? Hearing the slight breeze and the smell. That smell brackish and slightly fishy. It's the sea, she thought. That's right. Maybe they watered the plants with water from the sea. Then of course they were all gone, Gloriosa reasoned. Arvid came up to the girl and asked if there was a problem. I Safer jumped up and said, No, no problem. It's just that the garden is so beautiful. I was walking around admiring it. The guy replied to her that she could look around in peace because this was her home now. That's right. This is her home from now on. Now here, the girl thought. She told Arvid, but could she even take care of this garden for a little while? The guy said that if her body fully recovers, then she can do whatever she wants. So she can take it easy and cry in peace. No one will see her here. The girl said to Arvid, He seems to have spoiled her very much with his kindness. So the tears are pouring out on their own, just smiling at each other. Words that will be remembered for a long time in this place. She wants to revitalize both the garden and her life again. After the garden, they went to the study to do business. The butler said he had brought a cake this time, but Arvid refused and asked him to give it to Riosa. The butler placed a cake in front of the girl and said hopefully she would like it. Gloriosa crouched and thought, who knew she would be prepared for such a place? She didn't know if she would be a nuisance to Arvid. She thought they'd gone a little too overboard with the furnishings, pillows, and flower decorations and dessert, all for her. Arvid asked, Rosa, didn't you like the dessert? She never ate any of it. No, nothing like that, the girl said. It's just that this is your office, and she feels like she's in your way. Not at all, anyway. Someday this office will be yours, too. You can look through all the documents. He said to bring the documents with regular letters, in addition to the documents with the alphabet for the blind. Gloriosa thought she had never dreamed of such a thing. She wondered. If he said that, she could stay here for a long time. At the same moment, Arvid told his butler to bring all the documents in two forms. The butler held out the papers and said, Yes, here they are. While you were eating, word came from the regent. The Imperial family hopes that you will share this joy with them and congratulates you on such a momentous occasion as your wedding. Arvid reached out his hand, took the documents and said, That's not all, is it? Anyway, yes, there was an order to report together to the palace and greet them. It was said that if you came, it would be possible from now on not to attend the conquest celebrations three times. That's not even up for discussion. Speaking of the day of conquest, the head of the duchy and the heir from each family must appear at the imperial palace, once a year, 
to swear allegiance and kneel before the emperor after the day of conquest. Her father, out of his many wives, always went to her mother. That was what she remembered. At the moment, the Galaxios Empire is ruled by a young emperor. However, he cannot wield power as he pleases. In fact, the power is held in his hands by the emperor's regent. What is noteworthy is that the regent and the former empress were sisters. The former emperor married all the sisters and from the same family, and Magnus and the regent are lovers. Pradius Magnus will commit an atrocity by relying on the regentess's power, and it absolutely must be stopped, Gloriosa thought. Privatization of public roads within the empire, xenophobia, exploitation of orphan labor under the guise of charity, and also the next problem, the autonomous region of Hooks has dried up, oasis, and they can't figure out the cause. That's a problem, Arvid said. If Hooks can't function, transportation will stop running in the desert, Butler confirmed for the third month. Wait, you're talking about the oasis in Hooks, right? Gloriosa replied to Arvid. A piece of wood found nearby and an inscription in an ancient language are all the clues we have, Arvid replied. The girl remembers these events. She knows one of Magnus's atrocities about them, the drought and flood plan. Gloriosa asked to see this document. She thinks she can help with this case.